If you're able, please stand with me. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We sing our opening song from all the wind's wide quarters. Let us join together in the collect for purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Together, Almighty God, you call your church to witness that in Christ we are reconciled to you. Help us so to proclaim the good news of your love that all who hear it may turn to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated to listen for God's word. A reading from Exodus. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord looked in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, let us flee from the Israelites for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and in his servant Moses. I forgot that. <laughs> Sorry. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. With Hear your help, O Lord, Lord, we will Lord. listen and live. Thank you, Daryl. We respond with Psalm 114. Some feel that this is the psalm that was sung by Jesus and his disciples just before they went out um, on the night that Jesus was arrested. Hallelujah, when Israel came out of Egypt. Judah became the sanctuary of the Lord. The sea beheld it and, it, and fled. The mountains skipped like rams. What ailed you, O sea, that you fled? 
you mountains that you skipped like rams. Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, who turned the hard rock into a pool of water. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Just as Paulette is coming up to read our second reading, note that Ken's name was there. This is an old template, and he loved to read, so I'm sure he is reading with us in spirit this morning. A reading from Romans. God, oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong spot here, okay. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Let us stand for the gradual. be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. 
And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the gospel of Christ. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So, leaving aside for a moment our personal worlds, which I will connect back to in a few moments, there's a lot going on these days. Now, since I'm part of a strange group called Anglican clergy, I'm allowed to indulge in classic, stereotypical British understatement every once in a while, from time to time. Yes, there's a lot going on. I don't know what feels weirder these days, but just being sequestered indoors, knowing that I'm fooling myself with the quality of air that I'm breathing is a very strange and and bizarre reality that, that we're all living in. Climate change events, like the one outside, a worldwide pandemic, and then all the human political movements give us the feeling of a world that's changing at an unprecedented rate. Now, whether that's true or not, the feeling is there. And maybe you're raising children in the midst of this. Maybe you're unsure of what side of the political divides on all the different issues that are out there you're on. And as you try to navigate the the news cycle, which is now more polarized and politicized than it ever has been. What is the, the Christian response to the different movements of our day? Do we, as many Christians do, believe there is a right side and a wrong side? Ironically, you can speak to different representatives of the Christian faith, and you'll run into people who assume that all Christians will necessarily support conservative issues across the board. And you can run into Christians who believe that, who just assume that all Christians are progressives on all things. Now, I might be doing something a little strange here this Sunday, but in our first reading, we have an account of two mass movements, if you will, political movements. As it was in the ancient world, a world dominated by Egypt, represented by Pharaoh, 
and his armies and an oppressed slave people, Israel. Clearly the writer, clearly the reader knows who's right and who's wrong. And in this case, the judgment falls where it must, we think, on the heads of the Egyptians. End of story, right? Well, three years ago, I fictionalized an account of our first reading in which I imagined an Egyptian charioteer heading, hesitating to plunge into the abyss that was right in front of him with the rest of his army, though his god, Pharaoh, had commanded it. As he waited on the brink, staring at this bizarre sight in front of him, walls of water, questions raging in his mind, I had a dazed Hebrew slave emerge from behind a bush, thinking that now that Pharaoh's army had all plunged in, it would be safe to come out. Because he too had doubts. He too, of course, had been summoned through Moses by his God to follow everybody else. I imagine that as they faced each other in the midst of two seemingly irreconcilable realities, they found a way to talk, to share their doubts, to find a way to dialogue. And as they watched the chariot, the chariots beneath them get stuck in the mud, they found that they could travel the long way around together and join the rest of the Israelites. The Egyptian charioteer, now an immigrant, ready for new faith and new adventure. How convenient, you might think. How irreverent and romantic and anachronistic such a reading would be. But it's also how Gregory of Nyssa, great early church fathers, urged us to read these sorts of stories. Not as an us versus them, in other words, but as, 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 a, as a way in to wisdom without denying that the story is about the bold strokes and the terrible costs of coming out of slavery into freedom, our great tradition tells us that should, we shouldn't simply take these stories on uncritically and as a way to other nations that are not like us or other ways of looking at things that are not the way we look at things, but rather to use them in a way that continues to lead us to a true and empowering freedom. The scriptures themselves don't, of course, in the end, other the Egyptians, as the prophets make clear. Egypt becomes, in the great prophets, one of those peoples called by God to a special vocation. And it eventually becomes a safe place for Jews. There's a giant diaspora that settles in Egypt in and around the city of Alexandria. And of course, when you read the Gospels, you realize that Egypt becomes a safe place for Jesus, who in his childhood escapes there away from the murderous Jewish king, Herod. And then it becomes one of the great creative hotspots intellectually and spiritually in the early centuries of Christianity. So, the Bible is more sophisticated and more nuanced in its approaches to these issues than simply reading one story, uh, a story of judgment, and taking it in, an, in a certain literal sense. We live in a culture in which if you take a position or hold an opinion that is consider, considered uh, off limits or verboten by a particular group. Let's say you dare voice support for some of uh, President Trump's policies. I can hear the gasps, I'm not claiming to myself, but suppose you do. Or, or suppose you support marriage equality, regardless of sexual or gender identity. You're liable to be, depending on what group you're in, if not physically canceled, then certainly written off. You've become, in effect, one of those Egyptians, 
stuck in the mud, ready for God's judgment to come crashing down. Or perhaps to use the language of our text, you feel the walls closing in on any number of issues because as a member of this culture, in this society, you realize that unwittingly maybe, and again, we all share in this dilemma, if we're honest, you have, I have, a secular slash spiritual outlook on the world a hodgepodge of insights and judgments that we cobble together in an amalgam, is, which is our way of looking at the world, and that's constantly emerging and changing and morphing. So, do you dare share any of that with your friends, your family, your, your neighbors, your parishioners, fellow parishioners? In today's political climate, I've, I've found myself uh, at different times written off, um, not considered for certain positions because of a certain doctrine or insight or opinion that I've held. Maybe you've experienced the same thing. Is there towards the values of the kingdom of God towards freedom from oppression for all peoples, while at the same time accepting that there are people in our lives, our friends and our neighbors, family members, who may, may hold views radically opposed to ours. I think there is. The good news of God in, in Jesus Christ focuses not on a particular political or economic perspective, but on the quality of our spiritual formation. A formation that has as its end goal not being right in terms of intellectual agreement, but being reconciled in terms of love. And, and this vision of human society works incrementally for change. It does not seek to wipe out even those who are the oppressors, if you will. It does seek justice, but it seeks it in a way that the end goal is reconciliation. Now, I know that that view is really passe right now, that, that the left just wants to eliminate the right, and the right just wants to eliminate the left. And we're probably closer in our North American context to overt political violence than we have been for many generations. I was just watching the, um, the, the bizarre, for my mind, bizarre demonstration in Montreal. Um, so we, we're not immune, immune or a nerd to these things in our Canadian context. But God's good news, I think, is that the Holy Spirit is simply waiting for individuals and communities to cooperate with God and that there is hope for them. Because you see, the character of God that we see lived out in Jesus Christ, in human divine form, is the God who forgives seven, seven times 77, who makes dry land where there may only appear to be quicksand and death and has not given up on our societies even when mass movements and political movements seek to seduce us into canceling each other if we don't agree with each other. Now, we see some of this being modeled for us in Paul's instructions to the Romans. Here are some snippets of Eugene Peterson's paraphrase from the text that Paulette read to us, which was about eating meat that had previously been offered to pagan idols or not, or celebrating Jewish holy days or not within the Gentile context. And it stands in, those disagreements, those divides stand in for ours. Welcome with open arms fellow believers who don't see things the way you do. And don't jump all over them every time they do or say something you don't agree with even when it seems they are strong on opinions, but weak in the faith department. Remember, they have their own history to deal with, 
treat them gently. Now, this isn't some form of weak toleration, but true revelation. As true as the fellowship that develops between Simon the Zealot and Matthew the tax collector in Jesus' original 12 followers, which would have been an ancient version of secular humanism sitting down with reactionary religion, let's say, fundamentalism, and eating at a common table with Jesus. They could have only done this because they saw in Jesus the true pillar of fire and cloud through the middle of their old certainties, their old antipathies and hatreds. And they found common cause, not in each other's political viewpoints, but in Jesus, the reconciler. A new or renewed understanding of God. Now Jesus, in a strange story, tries to unpack a bit of this in the gospel text, in which he tells of a religion that has devolved into something in which those who don't measure up are consigned by the religious leaders of the day to the outside, to hell, and find that they can't possibly measure up or pay back what they owe. He finishes this story, which can be read, I think needs to be read obliquely, if you will, by saying that we'll be thrown into hell if we don't forgive our brother and sister from the heart. And I think we're meant to see a couple of things going on at the same time here. First off, it's a clear contradiction of what he started with when he asked, how many times should we forgive? which was seven times 77. Another way of saying, you always forgive. You always work towards reconciliation because that's what God always does. Secondly, though, there's a great dignity afforded to human beings because though God is not the one who ultimately will throw us into hell despite the parable that's been Uh, spoken of here. It's not a ledger keeping God. We throw ourselves into self-constructed hells when we fail to forgive. So there's a great dignity afforded to us to cooperate with God's love and forgiveness and mercy. We come at last to the God of Exodus again maybe reappreciating what's being said there, maybe reappreciating what it means to come into true freedom. We are now the new community, as Paul wrestled with, of Jew and Gentile, say Egyptian. We are now the rich and the poor, worshiping and communing together. We are the young and the old, the gay and straight, minority and majority cultures. We're indigenous an immigrant, and all of it because we've been led into 70 or seven times 77 towards a God who doesn't keep a debt ledger, who forgives our sins and longs to lead all of us towards the promised land. So I pray for my friends, my Anglican friends, who are some of the leaders of the Hong Kong marches these days, I pray for all who are protesting and demonstrating, whether they're on the right or the left. I should have said the right or the left. I do that because I'm left-handed. I get confused. I pray for all of us that our character in these days will be formed in concert with reconciliation. And I pray that all of us will hear God's voice and not the mere seduction of mob emotion. Lord, come quickly in our relationships in this society. Amen.
If you're able, please stand with me as we join in the affirmation of faith. We believe and trust in God the Creator, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist. We believe and trust in God the Word, who took our human nature, died for us, and rose again. We believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world. This is the faith we affirm. We believe and trust in one God, the holy and undivided Trinity. Please take a position of prayer, standing, sitting, or kneeling that is suitable for you. And as we did at our practice Eucharist on the 30th, I'm just going to invite the prayers of the people. So we'll begin with prayers for the church, globally and locally. Let us pray for the church. Please feel free to speak out your prayers. For the um, deliberation for our new bishop, may God grant all those deciding discernment. We pray for our brothers and sisters in the East Jerusalem, all the other congregations and churches. Let us pray for the world. I invite your prayers. Let us pray for the local community. For the leaders politically in our local community as we seek um, the best way forward in our planning for our community development plan. Let's pray for those who are suffering, who are sick, and in need in any way. Amen. Let us pray for and remember those who have died. We thank you, Lord, that you have encouraged us that where one or two or three of us have gathered, there you are, here you are in the midst of us, ready to hear our prayer, to know the beating of our heart, and to call us towards all that is good. We commit these prayers to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Come, my sisters and brothers in Christ, enter the door of grace where more forgiveness awaits us than this world could ever contain. Let us pray. Lord, your grace reaches through races and nations, neither favoring the righteous nor despising the uncouth. Lord, have mercy. God of love, your hopes for us are not deterred by human rebelliousness, indifference, or ignorance. Christ, have mercy. Holy God, you find us in our wandering and save us from all that would cut us off from the light of God. Lord, have mercy. Together, God of countless mercies, we confess our sins to you, knowing that you see our need much better than we do. Please forgive not only the sins we recognize, but also the many to which the culture in which we live may have blinded us. Uncover our private subterfuge, reprove our compliance with community evil, and bring us again into the blessed condition of grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, amen. Family of God, it is not your fate to carry the burdens of guilt or to be obsessed with painstaking yet vain self-justifications. There is no one who pardons more completely than our God and no savior whose peace is sweeter than that of our Christ. Receive into your heart and mind the rejuvenating life of the Holy Spirit. Now receive pardon, deliverance, strength, and life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now we will practice the peace at a safe social distance. We can bow to each other and say peace. Sisters and brothers, may the peace of the Lord be always with you. Our offertory uh, tray is here. You can bring that up at you can bring your offering up if you need to at the um, Eucharist, or you can do it now during the offertory hymn, which is with the body that was broken. We don't have the lyrics in the bulletin, so you'll just have to follow along best you can.
Holy God, accept all we offer you this day. May we who are reconciled at this table bring wholeness to our broken world. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. So with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right that we should praise you, gracious God, for you created all things. You formed us in your own image. Male and female, you created us. When we turned away from you in sin, you did not cease to care for us, but opened a path of salvation for all people. You made a covenant with Israel, and through your servants, Abraham and Sarah, gave the ble promise of a blessing to all nations. Through Moses, you led your people from bondage into freedom. Through the prophets, you renewed your promise of salvation. Therefore, with them and with all your saints who have served you in every age, we give thanks and raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy God, source of life and goodness, all creation rightly gives you praise. In the fullness of time, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He healed the sick and ate and drank with outcasts and sinners. He opened the eyes of the blind and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and to those in need. In all things, he fulfilled your gracious will. On the night, he freely gave himself to death. Our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Gracious God, his perfect sacrifice destroys the power of sin and death, by raising him to life, you give us life forevermore. Therefore, we proclaim our hope. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Recalling his death, proclaiming his resurrection, and looking for his coming again in glory, we offer you, Father, this bread and this cup. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts, that all who eat and drink at this table 
may be one body and one holy people, a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord, through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. 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 As our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Creator of all, you gave us golden fields of wheat, whose many grains we have gathered and made into this one bread. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. Just invite you to line up singly, six feet apart if possible.
I invite you to stand with me. Father, your word and sacrament give us food and life. May we who have shared in holy things bear fruit to your honor and glory in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. Now, it's kind of our tradition to look at each other as we say the doxology. So I know it's kind of hard to read it and look at each other, but you kind of go back and forth. Let's try it. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we could ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Just before we sing our final song, I invite you to stay and visit with each other, not inside, but outside um, at a social distance. And I guess it all depends on how much more smoke you want to breathe. Um, thank you for coming today. We'll meet again in this space on the 27th. You're always um, uh, welcome to join us in the, uh, in the live streaming next week. Also, you'll notice some announcements at the back. There is an online Compline service on Wednesday evenings, which is wonderful, and there is a virtual Bible study on Tuesday nights as well, which you can join just by clicking or registering at those links and you'll be invited in. Let's sing together, singing songs of expectation, although let's do it in a restrained manner. <laughs> To love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.